pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd agree as our roll call of uh, members, if we could start over here with Saul. Uh, so I'm guessing, I'm Chase, Gadget Transit. Richard Lang, Mayor Council. Dale O'Brien, Gadget Transit. Michael Pleasant, Gadget Transit. Mary Lozo, Gadget Transit. Jill Boudreaux, City of Mount Vernon. Steve Sexton, City of Brighton. Lisa Jackie, Gadget County. Lori Gira, City of Mount Vernon. Thank you. Item four is our public comment time. If there's anyone that would like to provide public comment, you're welcome to at this time. If you would state your name, city of residence, and limit your comments to about three minutes. Is there anyone for public comment today? Okay. Um, could I ask you maybe to step to the microphone there? Thank you. When we come to that agenda item, I'll give you a few minutes to kind of gather, but would you be able to address some of those questions for us at that time? I think combined, we could probably address those. Okay, we'll address that when we get down a little bit farther in the agenda. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other public comments today?
sooner notice on meetings so that we can get the 200 people that we had signed the petition to be able to show up in support of this. That's just about all I have to say. Dan, was the meeting agenda properly released and notice on the website? Yes. It's been on the website. All right, no other public comment. We'll go down to our consent agenda. Action items, we have items A and B. Any questions about the consent agenda action items? Also, we need All right. A second. Second. Motion by Lori of uh, consent agenda items A and B. Lori, just double checking. Yes. All right. Uh, and seconded by Steve. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Item six is an executive session. We are calling an executive session for the discussion of real estate property acquisition. We anticipate the time being 10 minutes. We'll give notification if we go over that time. So at this point, the board will adjourn to executive session at 108. Transit received $909,212 sales tax revenue in the month of November. This compares with $865,000 in November of 2014. This is a 5.11% or $44,205 increase over last year with a year-to-date increase of 7.02% or $611,935. Expenses, revenue vehicle, parts and supplies, ergonomic equipment and furniture, fuels are currently within budget. And all other expenses were as expected. The reserve account at the end of November operating $2,096,241. Facilities, 400000 Capital replacement, $3,862,466. Non-designated, $2,167,795. Total reserve, $8,526,502. Recommendation, staff recommends the board approve the monthly budget report. Any questions from Matoko on the budget report? All right, with that, I'd ask for a motion to accept the monthly budget report. Also, thank you. 
motion by Rory, second by Ken. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, saying sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Item B is a public hearing for the 2016 fiscal year budget uh, regarding public comments. So, Dale, do we just open a public hearing? And okay. Um, before we begin, um, if I could ask Dale, were there any questions or calls from the board um, regarding the budget as presented? There was a couple of public comments that came in. Um, Coco has the, the document she passed out to you. Um, one came from the CAC. It had to do with, uh, there was $5,000 reduction in our line item for marketing. The reason for that was we didn't spend what we had budgeted for 15. There's no reason to have that additional 5,000 if for some reason it does come about that that money is needed, we would go back in a year for a budget re revision, but it was just money we didn't need, so we took it out. Okay. Any questions uh, from the board before we open the public hearing regarding the budget? <coughs> go ahead, Lisa. Um, as I was um, just reviewing uh, the format that came with our agenda packet where it summarizes the revenues, I always go through this exercise of having to back out the reserve transfer in so that I really know what the revenues were, revenues to revenues, absent just the transferring in of reserve funds. And I would ask that it gets presented like that because you now in the revised mm -hmm. um, revenues, um, the transfer in from reserve funds, it appears is folded into other non-transportation revenue. And I don't know, it, it, I guess I looked at the uh, the rest of the board members, but it seems to me revenue is different than moving money out of a fund. So, because um, you can't really tell what your increase is um, from like 2015, it says 21.4 million dollars is the amended budget for revenue, yet 8.6 million of that was transferred in. Mm -hmm. So, I, I can doubt the 12.8 million dollar budget compared to you know backing out of reserve transfer ends of 1.8 million dollars. Okay, um, I put the budget in the format that, um, um, according to VAR's manual, so um, I can, well, and then, maybe in your narrative, mm -hmm. I think it's just important for the board to really know what we're projecting is increased revenue, improved revenue items, and not just cash transfers. Right, and then on the board's report, I did break it down. So uh, for the uh, total revenues, right? Total revenues still on the board report still has the revenue with reserves transferring. That's this sheet that we have. Right, and then it shows the reserve transfer in mm -hmm. to get to the total revenue. So, and then I separated the other non-transportation revenues. So is that how you want to see it? Or Would it be possible to, in this presentation to the board summary, subtotal it, subtotal, subtotal revenues before you add the line the, the, reserve transfer okay. in, and then I can truly see what the revenue to revenue okay. comparison is without the reserve transfer. Okay. That would be my question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, Matoka, we have a doc in this board sheet that you, that you handed out, the 2015 amended budget. Do we have a, a year end? Expected revenue figures also. I mean, the reason I'm asking is to get the sales tax, you're showing that the difference between 2015 amended budget and 2016 proposed budget, a 5% increase. How does that relate to what our actuals are expected for 2015? We're doing really good with sales tax revenue this year. So um, this year, year to date, um, like I read in the monthly report, it's a 7% increase um, year to date. And then compared to last year, it's 5% increase actual to actual. So we look in about um, 7 to 10% increase in actual sales tax revenue at the end of the year. Okay. So this 
Cypher said is just from budget to budget, not actual to budget. That, that's right. That's five percent from 2015 budget. More, but it's a more accurate comparison for us to make where we would actually end up at in 2015 and budget from there rather than what did we think in 2014 we're going to end up with and we look back that far. I guess. So it might be a better indicator for the board that might be. Okay. Other questions about the budget? Okay. Matoko or Dale, could you just review really quickly on the the expenses side, where am I going? Back in here. You know, there's a couple that have double digit increases, a 28% and a 35%. Could you just touch on that? Sure. Um, I think the, the one of the questions was uh, utilities budget is up 28%. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that 2015 was the actual full year that we operated all the park and ride. So, um, the budget 2015 was a bit lower than the actual expenses, so we have to increase the budget 28% uh, to okay. cover the actual cost for 2016. Okay. And then I think the second question was the leases and then the rentals. And um, maybe Al can. I think this is a porta potty <laughs> issue, perhaps, the rental and leases. The port body issue is one settled. <laughs> but I mean, is that the increase? Is what I was saying. <laughs> that's part of it. Well, that's part of the rental. That's part of the uh, increase of leases for rentals. That's also includes about uh, work that we're going to be performing uh, for rental equipment down at the uh, Chuck and a Park Ride at the South Mount Vernon Park Ride. And we got a lot of work left at Skaggy Station on the exterior as far as uh, we're going to need equipment, uh, rental equipment for that also. And along with the, uh, um, the port body issue, okay. about ready to happen. Okay. Any other questions before we open the public hearing regarding budget? <laughs> All right. At uh, this time, we'll open a public hearing regarding the 2016 budget for scheduled transit. Is there any public comments regarding budget? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing regarding the budget. Next up on our agenda then is um, item C, which is a resolution adopting 2016 budget. Is there any comments from the board? Or an action from the board? Well, I'll make a motion that we approve resolution 2015-08, resolution of the scheduled transit board directors approved in the fiscal year 2016 budget. Second that. Motion by Mike and a second by Lori. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. I think my microphone died, so I'll just try to talk loud. Item uh, 7D is the election of the chair and the vice chair. And I had a question for Dale. I know in our other committees, such as SCOG and the Transportation Policy Board, we had passed, or the board had decided that the Vice Chair would automatically go into the chair um, position after the year's end. So I don't know if we did that for scheduled transit or not. Someone just can someone remind me if we did that, or do we actually need to elect? Okay. In the past, we elected that if the board so desires to make a change, that the vice chair would take over from for the chair. That would simply be acceptable to the staff. Um, <clears throat> at the Washington State Transit Insurance Pool and the Washington State Transit Association. That's the way we do it. That way, the vice chair is very much aware. The new chair is very much aware of current events. Any discussion from the board on the decision of the chair and vice chair? Do we like the idea of just having the vice chair take the position after the event, or what do we think? I mean, that's not new. That's not like that. Okay. If we want to do that going forward, then, Dale, do we need to? Do you have any type of formality on that, or in the minutes? What do we do? I think the board should approve um, who the new chair will be. Okay. And uh, probably there should be a nomination, uh, and uh, uh, approving the nomination will be the uh, selection of the new chair. Okay. 
So the vice chair is Steve. So is there a, a nomination then for the chair for 2016? I will nominate Steve Sexton as the new chair from the Santa Transit Board. Okay. All right, so there's a nomination of uh, Steve Sexton for chair of the Skagit Transit Board for 2016 uh, by Lori. There's a second by Lisa. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying. All of those same sign. Motion carries. All right, we need to elect a vice chair for the 2016 year. Is there a nomination for a vice chair? I'll nominate New York City of Wallachie by Mary as the vice chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I take that? Yeah, you can. All right, there's a nomination for a vice chair. Is there a second? Second. Nomination by Lisa, second by Steve. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, moving on to item eight is our Citizens Advisory Committee report. Is there a report this month? Sure, yes. The Citizen Advisory Committee met last Tuesday, the, or sorry, the Tuesday of last week. Um, their main item on the agenda was a discussion of the budget. Other than that, they outlined um, uh, agenda topics for their upcoming three meetings. All right, thank you. Item nine is information items. We have a presentation on the South Fidalgo Island service options, and Carolyn is going to present to us. Hi everyone. So I think it was in, eight, in sorry in August when we had a large group from the South Fidalgo Island come to a board meeting and discuss the need for um, service in that area. And at that time, they brought a petition and other information with them. Today, I have a presentation to the board on some options to serve the area. But before we get into that, I wanted to address um, comments, questions from um, her public comment. So um, Troy's going to help me with that. But Colette brought up a question about the flex route transition of 49 to what we are going to call fixed route 409. One question was about bus stops along the route. And Colette, yes, there are time points on the map and there are bus stops in between those time points. We do make um, specialized maps that we can give to people who have visual impairments. And I'd be more than happy to prepare such a map for, for you or for anyone else. And that map can show all of our bus stops along the route. Um, given the route's uh, geographic area, I could probably even have in the next iteration of our writer's guides all of the bus stops shown in the writer guide itself. Um, so I'll, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Um, and then Troy, I was hoping you could speak about the capacity. Sure. Um. Yeah, I can assure the, uh, the members in the board here today that going backwards into the budget for 2015, we observed very closely what our needs were and the highest need really did direct us to the ADA demand. And that far back, I started planning on what we could do going forward, projections of our demand. And we went to the board asking for more hours in our budget to accommodate that demand that came in that we were unaware of or we weren't certain of the common ride or the regular rides. And we've been able to take that. If you remember, this all was sparked by the denial situation. And when that started, we were about 190 denials in a month. And the last two months, we've been at zero each month, which means we're providing all trips, all rides. And going forward into 2016, what we see today as far as staffing, and staffing in 2016 is completely different. So we have, we have a workforce that will be able to accommodate all those rides, all the ADA passengers, without any any challenges. I'm totally confident in that. So uh, it's my mission to stay at zero denials and keep that going. We work very hard in the department to do that. 
We're very aware of it. Thank you. Thank you. If, if there are any denials that we are aware of, uh, should they be directed to your department? Uh, that would be fine. I would like to know about it. Usually I know about it before you even know about it. I'm out there on the street because that's what the, the communication I have with our, our staff. Um, let me just reiterate or, or, or actually give you another example. Um, denials on Technically speaking, a denial can be someone that is still transporting. So understanding denials too is, is another concern. Um, somebody can be transported but outside of the window of an hour they ask for the ride, but we give them a ride because of scheduling demands. It can still be tallied as a denial, technically speaking, and for reports, but we may still give those people rides. Thank you. Okay, good questions collected. Um, so with that, I'm going to get into the presentation. So just a little history of transit service on South Hidalgo Island. Um, Skagit Transit used to operate what we call pocket service. Pocket service was a demand response type service um, that operated in our rural areas. That service began in 2003 and it was subsequently expanded in 2007 and 2009. Um, we served many areas of the county. Hidalgo Island was one of those areas, but you can see on the screen a list of other areas such as Campbell Lake, Sandwich Island, Bayview, Edison, Bow, Blanchard, Curry Road, and East County communities. So during that time of pocket service, Fidago Island residents received that service two days per week. So like Pier Transit today, those trips were scheduled in advance. Um, a driver would come to the house and pick up the passenger. The, I averaged um, boardings per hour for a three-year time span during that pocket service. So I looked at boardings from 2010, 2011, and 2012, and I found that average boardings per hour were 1.7. So just as a comparison, paratransit averaged um, 2.4 in 2014. Pocket service was cut to the South Padago Island in 2012. And this was at a time when Skagit Transit in general was moving away from pocket service and towards what we call flex routes. And um, that was really an attempt to reduce paratransit denials and to increase ridership in rural areas by providing a more reliable, consistent service, which is what we saw flex routes as providing. When those flex routes rolled out, some areas did not get a flex route, and South Padago Island was one of them. And as you all know, today is a period of time when Skagit Transit is now transitioning away from flex routes. So since August, we did a number of um, community outreach um, events and ways to get community feedback. And here's kind of a summary of what we received back. We had 13 completed online surveys, 39 feedback cards, um, three personal, com personal communications, and actually that number is larger, but some of those personal communications also came from people who completed the survey, so I didn't, I, I tried not to double count too much. We did have some duplications, so some people um, did fill out a comment card and then also complete an online survey, for example. But with no duplication, I did look at our responses and um, it showed that 29 of our responses were from households living in the South Padago, households in the South Padago Island um, that said they or someone in their household could use transit service. Several others said that while they didn't anticipate eating it now, they could see using it in the future. Most people said that the area they wanted to get to was Anacortes, but also people mentioned getting to further away locations, Mount Vernon, Burlington, Oak Harbor, or Bellingham. So now I'm going to get into the actual service options. The first option I'm going to explain is a ta taxi voucher program. The second is a demand response bus program, what, what I'm calling the South Pedago Connector. And the third option is a no service option. So a taxi voucher program would work like this, and this is modeled off of, off of other transit agencies and what they've done. It would be eligibility-based. Um, what other agencies generally do is have it be open to anyone 65 or older or anyone with a disability. One way that that would be easy to show to a taxi driver or someone 
extended transit when you're getting your vouchers would be to have our what we already have today, which is a regional reduced fare card. Some of these programs require um, when you get onto a taxi to pay a small copay. Um, some some <coughs> copays that I saw were three dollars. I'm proposing a copay of two dollars, which is the same amount that. Um, someone would pay when they got one of our county connector routes. One voucher would be needed for each one-way trip. However, while those vouchers couldn't be given away, the vouchers could be shared. So if you had a voucher, you could invite, for example, your husband along on your trip or a friend along on the trip, and one voucher would get you to where you wanted to go. Um, I'm proposing a voucher that's good for a fair meter reading of $17. So that, in addition to the copay, would get that, you know, any rider up to $19 worth of um, taxi ride. The taxi driver would then redeem those vouchers with Skagit Transit. I'm proposing that we um, allot 10 vouchers per month per, per client, so that would be five round trips. Of course, anything on the slide is subject to change. These are just ideas that I had in formulating this program. And some examples that I pulled from were King County Metro's Taxi Sprint Program and C-Tran. C-Tran is down in the Vancouver area at Clark County. Um, we recently did what's called an Ask Transit, where we asked transit agencies throughout Washington to give us additional information on their taxi usage and agreements that they have, and we're hoping to get some helpful information as well. So likely Skagit Transit would have to enter into agreements of some sort with taxi companies that would be participating, um, having to do with accepting these vouchers and the redemption of the vouchers. I just quickly called a couple of taxi companies and Anacortes to make sure they were still operating and kind of asked some general questions about capacity. Um, I found two that were um, operating Merck's Taxi and a cab for you. Um, Merck's Taxi said that they operate two vans during most times of the year and most times of the day. Um, if the board is interested in going in this direction, I'm proposing that we look at it as a 12-month pilot program and then evaluate at the end of 12 months. And some things that we could look for would be um, where the number of vouchers we budgeted for is sufficient. We could look into concerns about program abuse and try to remedy those concerns. And then um, getting feedback from recipients on if the program was working for them. So budget-wise, I'm, I'm anticipating that if the board wants to go forward with this option, that we should budget um, $36,720. And this is based off my estimation of program use. So I'm estimating 18 clients um, using the program 12 months out of the year with our maximum number of vouchers at the maximum price. So I think this is probably an overestimate of the amount um, of usage that we see. So I want to outline some of the opportunities and challenges with this program. I think I see opportunities as being primarily around efficiency and cost savings. So it would be um, very efficient. Only, only the demand would be supplied we wouldn't have, for example, a paratransit driver and vehicle um, scheduled to wait um, all day for possibly just a few rides. Um, I see that as something that could um, result in demands, or sorry, denial problems with our paratransit service. Also, there would be no day or time restrictions on travel except those imposed by the taxi company. If this were a service supplied by Skagit Transit, we would have certain days and certain times where we operated, and people living in South Padago Island would have no transit options outside of those times. Challenges, this would be a new program to develop. I don't foresee it being a difficult program to develop, but it would require some new procedures and new agreements. Um, taxis often cannot accommodate individuals using wheelchairs or motorized scooter, scooters, unlike our buses and our drivers. Abuse of the program is possible, but based on feedback that we've read from other agencies, we don't anticipate it. 
And lastly, um, there's a likelihood that if this program started here in South Pedago, that we would see similar requests for other areas of the county. I don't know if that's a challenge, but I think it's a reality, maybe. So the next program I wanted to explore is what I'm calling the South Pedago Connector, and this would be service provided um, by Skagit Transit, by our driver and our vehicle. So um, the area in white is the area um, we're calling South Pedago Island. Um, what's shown in the colors are our bus routes, so our 40X connects Marches Point and Anacortes to Mount Vernon. We have the Route 409, which circulates within Anacortes, and Route 410 connects the ferry terminal to Marches Point in Anacortes. So the South Fidalgo Connector would basically be a return to pocket service. It would be a service that would, would be offered um, one to two or maybe more days a week. Um, the service would have limited um, days and hours of operation. It would be demand responsive, so the bus would not have a set route. The bus would go to the house of the caller or near a uh, location near um, the home to pick up passengers. Unlike paratransit in general, what the South Pedago Connector would do then is um, transport those individuals either to another place within the South Pedago um, connector area or to one of our transfer locations like Marches Point. Um, eligibility, there would be no eligibility limitations. So this service would be open to anyone. There would be no age or disability limitations. Um, I am proposing a fare. I'm proposing a $2 regular fare, $1 youth fare, and $1 senior or disabled fare. I would also propose having a trial period on a service like this, and I think that sh I think that level of service we would be looking for would be two boardings an hour, so that's slightly higher than what the South Pedago Island saw between 2010 and 2012, but not by a lot. I think the um, scheduled transit would have to report back to the board um, on route performance six months into the after the inception of the program, and then do a full, full evaluation of the service after 12 months. And we'd be evaluating the program based off of that two rider per hour goal. And um, at that point, we'd have to look at service adjustments, additional marketing, or possibly even service cuts if it wasn't meeting performance. So this is just an example of how this could work. So I have two points, these are two homes of um, connector riders, and we have a bus leaving Marches Point, picking up a rider at A, circling around to pick up a rider at B, and then transferring, transporting them both back to Marches Point. From Marches Point, let's say one person gets on a paratransit vehicle and goes into Anacortes, and another hops on fixed route and goes into Mount Vernon. So depending on people's ability and their uh, destination, they would have access at Marches Point to get to different locations in a variety of ways. So I'm, um, for budgeting purposes, I'm showing two levels of service for this option. The first, um, option one, is two day week service at eight hours a day. This is an estimated cost of $70,000, $70,570 per year. Level, level two is one day a week service, eight hours per day. This is $35,300 per year. The opportunity, I see the opportunity with this service primarily being around the ability to transport um, with an ADA compliant vehicle and train drivers. The challenges, um, the level of service may not match the demand, so it could be more, it could be less. Um, I think that just like with the taxi voucher program, I think there is a strong likelihood that we will get requests for this type of service in other areas. For the, from the passenger side, there would be day and time limitations on when they could travel. That can be quite restrictive. And we know from what we saw from the feedback that while most people wanted to travel during the week, we also got people saying they wanted to travel on Sunday to go to church. But we can't meet all those needs. Um, providing ADA service, providing beyond ADA service in South Pedago may result in ADA denial. That's something we have to um, 
we have to work with to make sure that our capacity with paratransit is not impacted by taking a driver and vehicle off of paratransit service. I think there's a high cost as compared to the taxi voucher program. So we saw the two day a week service here is in the $70,000 range. And there's some likelihood that this service will not perform at the two riders an hour pool that we've set, and that's based on previous performance. And things might have changed in the area, that's quite possible, but um, 2010 through 2012 is not that long ago, and it was performing under two riders an hour. And the last option, of course, is no service, so the board may decide not to um, provide service to South Hidalgo. Um, so again, I think that the main thing to consider when um, looking at areas that are beyond ADA, so beyond scheduled transit's requirement to supply service, is um, how that might impact other areas of the county. And we will likely get requests from other areas. That's not necessarily a negative thing, but I think it's a reality that the board should go into this um, anticipating um, similar requests in the future. And that's it. Questions for question. Go ahead, Mike. On the taxi voucher program. Yes. Have you talked to the union about it? We've looked at the language in the contract, but we have not had a conversation with the union about it. Okay, because I know anytime we contract something or we think we're doing something, we have to negotiate that. Mm -hmm. There is a contract clause in our, our union contract that we have to go through with the group. <laughs> There is a union contract clause. There's a contract clause in our union agreement about contracting out. So we'd have to review that with the union. Any other questions on the board? Thanks for really good Is information there? to think about, Steve. Go ahead. Yeah, Carol, I appreciate the information and it, it's, it seems like there's no real perfect ideal fit for everything. In your opinion, which, you know, I don't know if we're all aware exactly what the very, very needs are of the folks at South Fidalgo. Which of these two would best meet the overall needs of the folks that live there? Well, I'd, I'd like to hear from the people here um, after this, but I'm most excited about the taxi voucher program, and I'll tell you why. And it's because it's responsive to the individual's travel patterns. Rather than, scheduled, rather than the rider having to change their travel patterns around the day we have a, a vehicle and driver schedule. That's why that program is most attractive to me. It's also attractive because if, in the end, we only have a small handful of people in South Fidelco taking advantage of this service, we won't have to cut it. It would just naturally result in a lower amount of budget impact, but we wouldn't necessarily have to make any other changes. If we implemented, for example, the South Hidalgo connector and we got very low ridership, we would have to cut it. And that always, even if only a few people are riding, it's always painful and it impacts those people very greatly. So um, I, I personally think that the taxi voucher um, solution is interesting. It would be new for Santa Transit. And I think this would be an interesting location and good location to try it from. And there would be no long-term commitment on our part to have this out there for a year or whatever. If it's not working, we can make a change to it at any time, given the fact we're operating. For, for both pro programs, I'm uh, proposing that we start them out as pilots and uh, see how they perform. Um, with the taxi voucher program, however, there's really no performance measure other than is it working for the people we're trying to serve, and is there a use? Um, did we budget the right amount of vouchers? Well, and I, I, I like I like that program too. It's a private public partnership. My feeling has always been if you can find a deal on pages government, not not to be doing it. And this place right in that fits is something that can be picked up by the private sector and it allows more flexibility for, for scheduled transit. But I guess I'm kind of torn when I when I think about this I and mean, we look at, ext at extending services and, and on it's gonna be I think you're absolutely right, there's gonna be more requests down the road out in the past will happen. Is it, you know, I understand there's needs out there, we need to meet as many of those needs as we can, but the trade off is, I think, when folks move to some of the remote areas, 
what's the expectation level for services in that area? You know, how, how at what expense do we do that? And are we jeopardizing other needs that, that apply to more folks who are in a, in a more, you know, urban setting or whatnot? So it's, it's a balancing act that we're going to have to take. I don't know. Hi, Yeah, um, what is the criteria you now? I saw where it said uh, 18 and 64 if you were disabled. Oh yes, the eligibility for the for the taxi, and this is this is just how I would envision the program. It could be different. So it could be sixty-five and just anyone. Right, sixty-five really? and older, or or people um, who have a disability. But if, but if they're just sixty-five, I'm sixty-five. So I. Yes. Uh, the point is, if you were, and then where is the geographic uh, or where? Yes. I mean, right now we're we're in South. Like I saw where you said people. Big Lake might want, well, or Birdsview, or I mean, where are you going to say yes or no to? I mean, that's the point I'm getting. We're going to give it to these people. We got to give it to everybody. I mean, that's what I feel is pretty fair. And then, what's it going to cost? I mean, uh, you know, a taxi from um, Grassmere to to maybe Anna Quarters. They want to go to Anna Quarters. We only give them 15 bucks. Or, mm -hmm. All right, I'm just saying it's, right. a, it's a can of worms. Right. Might be good, it's great, it sounds great, but. And I'm just gonna answer one small part of your comment. So, um, for example, with the cha taxi voucher program, it would have a dollar limit, and let's say someone did wanna take a very long ride, um, the taxi voucher would be good if you use the um, program elements that I put forward for $17 for it, and then the rider would be um, uh, responsible for the remainder. But I mean, you're gonna and then what about some, the people in town would not be eligible in the city? Correct. Okay. So it would be the eligibility requirements would also be place based. So you would have to reside in the South Padago Island to take advantage of this program. Or a big lake or somewhere that mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of sand child. Mm -hmm. So I think those are, there's all those, uh, well, we'll correct me if I'm wrong, Carolyn or, or Dale. Are those policy decisions where we would, as a board, say we move forward on this particular program? We would, as a policy, say if it's served by paratransit, fixed route, flex route, it's not eligible for the taxi program, or is it defined by federal kind of regulations when we're, we have to geographically identify a, a, an area of service? I don't right, so this is beyond ADA service, so this is okay. an area that's beyond um, what we are required to serve. Okay. So the service um, level and the type of service we provide in this area, we have a lot of flexibility over. And um, again, I would say that starting a program in South Padaku that was beyond ADA transit as a pilot program um, might be a good way to see how it goes and go from there with other, see how, how many requests we're getting from other areas. But I think that that concern about requests from other areas, it will happen because we get those already. So um, we should anticipate. So it would, it would be a purely policy decision based on the board of scheduling it. A board of On how to do it, yes. Okay. Thanks. Any other discussion from the board? I would anticipate we would want to think about these particular options, absolutely no action taken today. Okay. But perhaps um, think about it as board come back in January and have it on the agenda again. Um, maybe there's other ideas that will come from this discussion. Um, I think as a board, if we can remember, we were we tried a transit service in Big Lake and ended up canceling it because of the ridership issues. So perhaps this is something that can be tailored to those areas we've already experienced. You know, like you said, Karen. Right. Any other comments from the board? Go ahead, Ron. Just one question. So you're looking at ten vouchers per person or per household per month, roughly, mm -hmm. and they would need two vouchers on each trip. Yes, so it would be five, if you were using them for round trips, it would be five trips per month. And again, those types of program elements can all be changed by by the board, which is kind of an example, but yes. And roughly, I have no idea what it costs to taxi from downtown and a quarter south to south for downtown. What's the fare right now? Do you think it's well? About 40, well, one way. 40 both ways. Round trip, round trip. Round trip, 20 both ways. From where we're going. That's what I'm concerned about is we're, probably, we're guessing maybe $70 per way. Mm -hmm. Just an example. I think 
we need to look at it. I think uh, it was mentioned come back in January with uh, some more numbers. Um, but at some point, if you're going to have a flex route, it costs so many dollars for that too. And so at some point, the taxis cost more than the flex route to go to flex route. Mm -hmm. Well, there's really nothing saying that the, the, the scheduled transit could negotiate a set price with the, with the taxis providers also. So we're going to do this much business, let's get a better price for these clients. So, yeah. Thank you. Quick follow-up question. Um, you mentioned that the taxi companies are going to have to